It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Mark Tolan, DDS, MBA. He is the CEO of Tolan Healthcare Environments Design. You probably know it as The Design, T, capital T, period H, uh, E, Design. Dr. Tolan earned his dental degree and an MBA from the University of Texas. He is the former CEO of the nation's premier dental office design firm, which created over 3,000 offices in virtually every state of the Union, Europe, and Australia. His career in dentistry spans over 30 years, including clinical practice before obtaining his MBA from the University of Texas. He is the author of three dental textbooks published by Lee and Faberger, the most recent of which is a comprehensive book on all aspects of dental office design with over 7,500 copies sold. That's amazing. Dr. Tolan has lectured extensively in the U.S., Europe, Australia, Asia, and is a former consulting editor to the Parent Corporation of Dental Economics, which is Penwell. Uh, that was um, their first magazine was Pennsylvania Oil and, and uh, Wells. And then 100 magazines later, they were at Dental Economics. Um, currently, he is the principal instructor of the extremely popular dental office design seminar, Inspiring Success, sponsored by ADEC of Newburgh, Oregon. He consults with Pelton and Crane, conducting three-day sales training programs for their dealer equipment and sales representatives, and a two-day office design conference for doctors, audiences averaging over 350 uh, dentists per show. Um, he is just the man. I'm so excited he came on the show. But before before we start the show, um, I want you to say something about um, um, the passing of uh, Ken and Joanne Austin of ADEC. They were uh, they were legends in dentistry, and uh, and I know you're uh, great friends with them. What what did you think of them, and how did they contribute to your career? Well, uh, I started working actually with ADEC in 2016. So um, uh, Ken Austin, uh, Joanne had already passed away, but uh, Ken was uh, still alive, still coming to the facility, but no longer actively involved with day-to-day -day activities. But uh, very, very much uh, what I would call an Imagineer, you know, almost like a Disney Imagineer, uh, an engineer with a tremendous uh, capacity to conceive of new ideas and be the entrepreneur. So uh, thank goodness that he uh, lived in America and he created a fantastic company. And uh, and I'll have to say it really is a, uh, a top drawer operation from beginning to end. And if anybody ever has the opportunity to go out to Newburgh, I mean, just the physical plant alone looks great. And in fact, I, I've always said I would, I'd like to just be a gardener at the, at the facility. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah, it is. It is a uh, one in a kind, and uh, I just love that guy. I mean, my my four boys were blown away. I mean, you go in one, the entrance door, they're dropping off pallets of wood and metal beads and leather planks, and at the other end of the building, a football field down the line is rolling off a deck chairs, and it's just a story where the whole thing could have only been done by those two lovebirds just with a dream to do it. Because if someone uh, made you and me do it, I, I don't think we could have done it. I mean, it's just, just an amazing man, an amazing story. Uh, just just uh, crazy amazing. And then the same about Pelton and Crane. You go out to, uh, you go out to Pelton and Crane, too. I, I, uh, I used to uh, work with Pelton and Crane uh, for, for many, many years, over 12 years. Uh, I went out to Charlotte and did uh, conducted uh, dental office design conferences uh, with and uh, for them. So uh, we had hundreds and hundreds of uh, what I call alumni, uh, doctors who had come out there, listened to the two-day uh, event, and then had consulted with me on a variety of uh, issues surrounding their, their office design. Okay, so going into um, going into today's discussion, um, the office design. First, first of all, tell tell everybody what is your business and what is it that you do. Okay, um, it, it, it's interesting. Um, when my son was a little boy, he's now thirty four and on Wall Street. But when he was a little boy, he was always a little confused about what I did, and uh, he said, "Well." When he was asked, what do I do? Uh, he said, well, my father would get on, uh, he, he works at home for a while, then he gets on an airplane, he goes solve some problems, then he comes home and he starts working again. So uh, I thought, yeah, pretty much sums it up. <laughs> but uh, what, I, what I do uh, every day 
is uh, be involved with the design and the financing of dental offices. And really, Howard, we create kind of a Ritz Carlton level of dental office, but all the offices, uh, as one uh, doctor put it, move like a Swiss watch because our objective is to drive production and to minimize the physical stress of the staff inside the uh, inside the facility. And so our objective is to, yes, design great offices, but at the end of the day, we're there to help doctors optimize their production and minimize their physical stress. So do you go more by uh, the design, capital T period, capital H period, capital E period, the design or Tolan Healthcare Environments Design? No, T-H-E design. T so T T so you you don't ever so you so most people don't know what it means. I mean they don't use toll in healthcare environments design. No no no. If if everybody wanted to know what the acronym stood for, okay. Are you the founder of that or the CEO? No, I'm I'm the, the founder too. So you're the founder and CEO. Yes. Wow. Um. Well, congrats. And how old's the company? Um, I, I I'd say now we're about twenty seven years old. 27 years old. I want to start just from my um, bizarre thoughts about um, this whole industry is that you're going to spend a third of your life asleep. Well, get a, get a damn good bed and don't have a TV on the wall. And don't have alarm clocks and blue light. I mean, my bedroom is a cave. I mean, you know, I mean, because we're dentists, we, we've studied sleep apnea. I mean, you know, if, if your best idea is to sleep every night with a St. Bernard dog and leave the TV on, uh, you should give someone your dental degree that can use it. And then, so, so you sleep a third of your life, so you're uh, awake the other two thirds, and one third of that is in your dental office. And right. their best idea is that they're going to live in a thousand square foot shoebox in an operatory that's 10 by eight, and that's how they want to spend a third of their life. And right. I just thought to myself, um, and then and then you look at um, when, when, you know, you look at rich people make fun of when poor people own a uh, car that's worth more than their house, or you know, they they put all their money in consumption. And so then this dental dentist, I see, oh, they own a three thousand square foot home that's nice to visit and fun. But then they live in a rented thousand square foot shoebox, and then they're always surprised because they're burned out. They want to win the lottery. They don't want to go to work. I mean, the first thing I figured out when I walked in my office is, um, you know, first I had to rent because I was a kid out of school. Yep. And I sat there every day and think, I walked in here at dark and left at dark. I didn't even see the light. I wanted a window in each operatory. Um, I want, what's the favorite, what is the favorite room of every house? It's wherever the refrigerator is. I want a refrigerator, a break room. God, if an assistant's got a migraine, you don't even have a couch. So, so put your dad hat on and tell, talk to this 25 year old kid that thinks to save the most money, he's going to live in a shoe. And yeah. that'll be the best life. I mean, do you think that's ridiculous or what? Yeah, uh, my uh, my comment would be: don't eat the seed corn. Uh, don't don't go out and uh, and take your money and start using it to buy fancy cars and to build uh, big expensive houses. The very first thing you want to do is create an environment that is consistent and congruent with the level of care you propose to your patients. And if you have an office that looks the part and sounds the part of what you want to be, then you're going to be able to be able to uh, be successful and be able to communicate with your patients about the, the quality of the care that you're delivering to them. And uh, then it becomes all about it becomes all about delivering the care, not about being able to get the patient to say yes. And I just want to beat up this one point again um, that um, I see all around the difference. If you ask me, what's the difference between rich people and poor people? I would say you, you can find out in a second. Just just hand a poor person a $100 bill and yep. it'll like burn his hand and he'll have it spent before sundown. 
They yeah. cannot hang on to money they spend as fast as they can. So if you're still using, you borrowed other people's money, you complain about your dental student loans, but I don't see you deciding it's a good idea to work at McDonald's for $15 an hour for 10 years to save up to go to dental school and count in cash. I see that you're, you understand enough logic of financial leverage, geometry leverage, uh, uh, Newton, give me a lever long enough I can lift the earth. And that it's better to go borrow someone else's money, go to dental school. And when I started dental school, I'm making $10 an hour. When I graduate, I'm making $100 an hour. That, that's a smart decision. But some dentists at 50 years old, they're still borrowing other people's money for cars and houses. And you don't get it. And if you own your land and building under your home, which is consumption, before you own your dental office, you're a peasant, and I guarantee you when you're 65, you'll still be using other people's money. So your whole life, every time you use a dollar for a year, you'll pay a dime interest to someone else instead of having a dollar in a stock where they'll pay you a nickel a year for the use of your money. So you're either going to loan poor people your money to make a nickel a year the rest for eternity i mean the rockefellers are dead but they had so much money those big trust funds are still cashing hundreds of millions of dollars a year so when you get a dollar you could put it in a bank and make a nickel a year until the end of time or whenever the next big bang is but you mm -hmm. can't do that i give you a dollar you just instantly have to spend it because that's why you're poor. So, so um, I, I can't say enough the difference between use other people's money to build a dental office and you're saying build a dental office that creates a, an environment that conveys the level of care. Um, explain that to the kids. You know, most of our viewers are under 30. Right. That, that might seem obvious to you and maybe not to them. What, what, what do you mean by that? Um, let's use uh, Starbucks as an example. They, Starbucks is a fantastic uh, uh, kind of a almost morality lesson for us in, um, in being able to match the product with the environment. There are coffee shops all over the world. And, um, and, and if you just think about this for a second, uh, in 1975, Howard Schultz had to pitch the idea of coffee shops. He's got this new idea called Starbucks. He wants to get a bunch of investors together. They're all going to become rich because he is uh, uh, he's going to have a very, very unique coffee shop. And then he says, but wait a minute. It's not just coffee shops. It's going to be expensive coffee. We're going to charge three and four and five dollars for a cup of coffee. And not only that. It's only one cup of coffee, where in America in 1975, everything is a bottomless cup of coffee. The, I mean, it sounds like there's no way this is going to work, but it does. And the reason it does, the secret to Starbucks is they match the environment with the product. They put a high quality product with a beautiful environment and people want to come into Starbucks and they want to have a superior experience at Starbucks. And that's just a great example of here. It, so we, we want to have an office that says who we are. We want to now, we want to be an office that says exactly who we are and the quality of the care that we deliver. And we have to speak to people in a language they understand. They don't understand dentistry, but they understand nice environments and they understand exactly uh, what, what you're doing when they walk into a beautiful facility where everything has been thought of. And that's a constant comment patients have. They say, oh my gosh, the doctor's thought of everything in here. Ergo, therefore, the doctor will think of everything about my particular situation. So that's what I'm talking about when I say we want to have an office that matches the quality of care. And Starbucks was uh, confusing uh, to me because I'm from Kansas. I mean, I knew it was going to be successful because the CEO's name was Howard. I mean, that was a dead giveaway. But in Kansas, you didn't ever have to pay for coffee. Every filling station in Kansas had a coffee pot, the, the little white styrofoam cup. You could have the little pink sugar, the cubes, the stick. I mean, you didn't even pay for coffee. Then this guy says, oh, I'm, I'm going to sell it for five bucks a cup. And you're like, are you out of your mind? 
Right. And right. and he was the next billionaire. So when you're saying, well, dentistry is a commodity, dentistry is a commodity, dude, dude, coffee was free my entire childhood. No one ever walked into a filling station and paid for a cup of coffee. And then right. and Howard Schultz turns it into a five dollar cup. So that is something. So would you say is it over simplistic overly simplistic simplistic to say that you're a dental office design and construction company? Uh, I would say we, 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 we design the dental office. We build the office on paper. We create the office virtually, but we do not construct it. We will uh, interview general contractors with the doctor and generally with the uh, dealer uh, representative and we'll, we'll come to a consensus as to uh, which general contractor is most qualified. Then we shepherd the general contractor through the construction process to be sure that they build exactly what we designed. Okay, tell me when I'm wrong. I mean, I know it's my show, but you just call me. No, you're wrong. My my 32 year takeaways is I don't care what you're designing in five years you outgrew it and you're you always regret not being beta. You know, some kid always say I'm written a thousand square foot and putting four ops. I'm like okay, but before your lease expires, you 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 give away your car to have a fifth or sixth off. So it's never yeah. big enough. Uh, they never have the money because they they put it in their home and vacation or car. So I'm always saying. Own your dental office, rent your house, and if you think it needs to be a square foot, make it two square foot. Now, is that just wrong, dumb? What, 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 what do you think are the most common mistakes that dentists make in designing and constructing a new office? Well, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, the first, the first and biggest mistake uh, so many doctors make is they don't build an office with enough operatories and <laughs> and the office is not appropriately sized to support the operatories so we uh we very carefully assess what the doctor's going to need and then we you know i mean you have to have a little bit of crystal ball looking 20 years into the future the average uh, doctor will be in their office for 17 and a half years before they move or retire and so we want to be able to have enough ops. You know, if I tell a doctor, um, many times I'll be talking with a doctor who's coming out of five ops. I listen to uh, what their story is, how many uh, uh, active patients they have, what their plans for the future are. And many times they'll say, okay, you need eight, not you need nine, you need 10. And they think, oh my gosh, that's crazy talk. But if you actually break down the, the financing on this, the big issue is being too short of ops. If you're short ops, you're losing a minimum of $10,000 a month because most doctors who can even qualify for a loan to build a new facility, it takes, uh, they're, they're generating about $10,000 uh, a month per operatory minimum. When we go on to 15 and 20, and many doctors today are doing 25, and uh, the ones who are not going to debt are doing 25 plus, up to maybe 40, 45 thousand dollars a month per op. You're, you're saying they're building 25 operatory dental offices? Oh, uh, we've actually done that, uh, and we do probably uh, 122 to 25 op office uh, every year, one, but. On average, what I'm going to say is most of the ops offices that we're going to build are going to be probably a minimum of eight ops. No, we go up from there, you know. But uh, for a single doctor, what we're looking to do is make sure they are not short operatories for the entire time that they're in their office. Because if they're short ops, they're losing a minimum of $10,000 a month per op that they're short. So that that's your big danger. The big the 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 actual the average um, incremental cost of an additional operatory that's fully equipped. When I'm talking about debt service, is about seven hundred dollars a month. So you're betting the seven hundred dollars a month against the ten thousand a month, or the twenty thousand, or the thirty thousand dollars a month. And so it's a foolish bet. And if you if you take the equipment out of the equation, if you're just using, uh, if you're just building an empty operatory and holding on to it in the event you may need it, 
then you end up uh, having a debt service of around $300 a month uh, for just storing, so to speak, that empty operatory. But if you just go through the numbers for a second, once you bring on, once you bring on that uh, operatory, I mean, in one to two months, you've paid for that op, even if it's been empty for five years. So it's a uh, it, it's a, um, a a foolish uh, thought to build an office that doesn't have enough ops. And in fact, what I would encourage you, doctor, you will be successful if at the end of your 17 and a half years, your 20 years, whatever it is before you move, if you have an operatory you never used, that was a good thing because you never lost money. Yeah, now, and, and the other thing they don't think about when they're 25 is liquidity. Maybe someday they'll want to sell and DSOs are major purchasers, and they, they have a minimum. Like, like they don't even want to buy an office that collects seven fifty. Well, what, what do you th- what do you think the minimum that the big boys will come in and and buy you that versus no, you're too small. Uh, we're not even interested in looking at your place. Do you see Do you see them having minimum size purchases? I don't really see that. What I see is they're always looking at upside potential. They're always looking at what 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 could we turn this into? Because the, obviously they have to earn more in order to uh, handle the debt service as they as they uh, pay the doctor uh, for the for that uh, for that practice. So more it's more about what kind of upside can they develop out of the out of the office rather than uh, just the physical size of the facility. So on your book, you put, it was a guide to designing the elegant dental office. You should have named it Size Does Matter. (laughs) A guide to designing the uh, the dental office. Uh, By by the way, um, you have two amazing books on on, uh, Amazon. You have a guide to designing the elegant dental office, the largest marketing tool of your career, third edition, Uh, by yours truly on Amazon. The step-by-step guide reveals the fact-based decision process by which you are able to decide whether to build, lease, remodel, or buy a condominium. The proven principles of dental office design are revealed that have been developed over three decades and 3,000 offices. These principles are focused on driving productivity and reducing the physical stress of daily practice. Every room of the office is examined to optimize its functionality and efficiency. Uh, That's a hell of a and uh, then your other one is giving form to your future 100 award-winning dental office floor plans Um, the floor plan is the architectural foundation of your new office a properly designed floor plan yields optimal productivity and minimal stress but a poorly designed plan will impede your practice and minimal stress um, um, objectives daily and hourly this book clearly describes how to approach designing the single best floor plan I, i gotta tell you so I was born in Wichita, and when I was 10, my dad bought a Sonic drive-in franchise every wow. year from 10 to 20. And wow. so you live in Dallas. That's where I met Ray Kroc because um, he lectured at the – he was the big speaker in the hamburger conventions. And yeah. that guy was a genius. When he – reading your book, giving form of – do you know what his secret was? When, when he picked up McDonald's, they had 10 locations. And from, like, location 11 to 30, he would first lay the foundation – have the architects chalk out what it looks like, get all the employees there, and then he'd start talking to them, what, what's going on? Well, every time I make a malt, I turn around, and then this Mark guy knocks me down. Mark, what were you doing? I was trying to bring the french fries over. And it was that's how they did it from 10 to 20. I mean, it's everything. And when I started to build my office, and that architect said, um, well, what? Wh- how do you envision this thing looking like? And I'm like, uh... I think I have the wrong guy. I mean, I'm real little and young, and isn't this what you should? So I went and got this guy, and and it was amazing what he did for me, and I didn't even appreciate half of what he did for me till the ensuing ten years. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, but I, but my dentist, um, you know, I always tell them to stay in their lane. They don't know a damn thing about designing a dental office. Um, so, um, a lot of people um say things like um. Well, they wouldn't know the difference between an A deck chair and an IKEA chair. Uh, they, they don't. They, they don't know that. Is, is that true? I mean, 
you, you well, we're talking yeah. about size matters. You need more operatories, but does does name brand equipment, Pelton and Crane, ADEC versus IKEA, does it even matter? Does it matter to the patient? Or I mean, it, obviously it matters to the to the doctor because of the ergonomics involved. Because we want to be able to employ certain principles of ergonomics, especially inside the operatory. Um, and without getting into the weeds right now, because it, it, it takes a little bit of time to explain, but we want to we want to engage in very, very specific motion inside the operatory. In order to do that, you have to have equipment with the very specific design and very specific motion capabilities. So yeah, it does makes a huge difference about what kind of equipment that you put into a facility. Now, if we just talk about delivery systems, though, for just a second, I would say that the, the delivery systems that are offer the greatest opportunity to create the uh, least amount of motion uh, among the doctor as well as the assistant is either going to be a flexible rear delivery system or a continental system. Those two systems will allow the doctor and the, well, the entire dental team to participate in four-handed passes. And that's what I really try and uh, espouse in, uh, during the conference because the four-handed passes drive down your treatment time by almost 25%. They reduce all the repetitive motion in the operatory and it, and it creates a superior experience for the patient because, you know, who enjoys having somebody's hands in their mouth? And so, and you don't want to keep your mouth open. And so if, if uh, the dental team is able to affect the treatment very quickly, this is a win-win for the patient and for the dental team. So, yeah, I, I think that equipment does make a big difference and delivery systems make a big difference. Heck, lighting makes a big difference in the in the operatory, Howard. I mean, you, you've been there for, for many years. I was in it for many years. Um, you, you, you get fatigued eyesight uh, later in the day and um, and and uh, your eyes see a glare at three or four in the afternoon. They never saw in the morning. Um, and so we've got to have a very specific ratio of ambient lighting to operating light. And the operating light has to have very specific physics also. So, yeah, I think all kinds of things uh, inside the operatory matter. And uh, they greatly impact the ergonomic uh, health or just the musculoskeletal health of the dental team. You, you said a new term to me. You said continental delivery system. I've always heard of side delivery, rear delivery, over the patient delivery. Did you right. say continental delivery? Yeah, con well, continental is a form of over the patient delivery. Okay. And, okay, but, uh, but it's a form of over the patient delivery that allows the assistant complete and total um, access to the, uh, to the system using a, uh, uh, just a class three motion or uh, just rotating the shoulder and hand rather than, uh, rather than having to rotate the trunk at all. So do you agree with me and will you sign my petition that dental schools will never accept any left-handed people ever again? I mean, we're already 90% of the winners. I mean, we just need to get, because you, you can't, you have to do rear delivery or something because if one, I mean, it's like these DSOs tell me the hardest thing they have is finding an associate dentist and yep. the associate turner. So they finally got a great dentist and he shows up and then they find out he's a lefty and they're like, ah, how do you solve the lefty problem? Uh, and, and exactly with either the flexible rear delivery system that allows the left or right handed doctor to work with equal facility or with a continental system because the continental system can be flipped entirely can be flipped. So you've got a uh, um, you, you've got a, a rear delivery workstation for the assistant along with the continental uh, or over the patient delivery system or you just have uh, flexible rear delivery and the handpiece delivery head and the assistant delivery head are on the assistant's workstation and she is handing everything to the doctor. So the only one you can't have is a side delivery system. Right, side delivery isn't gonna work. And, and what I would call the uh, the old style 
uh, transthoracic or over the patient system um, really doesn't work either. Uh, if you're trying to do forehand efficient forehanded passes. But do you agree that my idea is better just to not never accept a lefty to dental school again? <laughs> Solves the problem. That would just be uh, because that is a huge, um, huge problem. So um, the other thing, so you say equipment matters. Um, um, another thing, uh, what I look for is there's two million dentists on Earth. No matter where you go on Earth, they're in the top one percent years education. Top five, they're, they're always the smartest people around in, in a country. And so when I see big discrepancies, like why do all these smart dentists with the same brain over here do this? And why do they do it different over here? And one of those is electric hand pieces. There, there's countries where the whole country is electric. And then you yeah. go to another country and there's no electric. So how, how what's your, your views on uh, looking at that? I mean, I mean uh, people always have their hand piece break down. They're having to autoclave them. I mean, there's, it's so multifactorial. Where, where, where would you recommend a new dentist coming down on that? Uh, on either electric hand pieces or on air yeah. turbines. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, to me, um, again, it's all about productivity. And so I'm going to have backups on top of backups. If, if, if I like electric, uh, because of the, uh, because of the torque and the, uh, and the cutting ability, um, in the efficiency, then I'm just going to have plenty of them. And, and, uh, I, I, so many doctors cut the onion too thin in terms of, well, what we were just talking about with, um, being able to have an environment that drives productivity. I want the office to always work every day. Therefore, I'm going to have a great office. I'm going to have an office with the highest quality materials in it because I always want it working well. And so I may be, if I am buying electrics, I'm buying top of the line. If I'm buying air turbines, I'm buying top of the line. Um, and I'm just not going to, uh, I'm not going to tolerate downtime because if uh, you actually do a little bit of calculation, the ADA says that um, the average office has three hundred dollars an hour overhead. Okay? That's your that's that's your the, the clock is running. So every minute we've got five dollars a minute uh, to just keep the door open. So I want to be sure that I've always got the equipment I need. So I would I would say electric or air turbines are fine it just depends upon what your preference is but whatever you whatever you do have have plenty of it heck i'd even have a a, a backup uh a system for my uh, vacuum and compressor because i do not want to go down and another i'm just going over things that i have um that i thought were crazy that I've watched dentists do their whole life. So I go into your office and you, and I get a cleaning done and uh, you come in and you check my cleaning and you say, Oh, you have this little bitty cavity. Um, hey, Howard, do you want to do it now? And I say, yeah, can you just knock this out? I mean, I'm right here. Come on, Mark, you're a dentist. You got an MBA. Can you do it right now? And the first thing out of your mouth is, well, we're going to have to move you. It's like, well, wait a minute, I'm in a dental office, I'm in a room, I'm in a, I'm in a chair, I mean, I'm looking at the light, what's wrong? Oh, well, we don't have, we don't have one thing, yeah. so we're going to move you because we don't have one thing. And then I look at the genius, the, the greatest businessman in my lifetime was in your backyard, Herb Kelleher, where he said, look at, look at Southwest Airlines, the last thing we're going to do is have five different kinds of planes. We're only yep. going to fly a 737. Every pilot can fly it. Every flight attendant, you know. And then so I go in and dentist. I said, well, every operator should be a 737. If I yep. come in there and I want to do a filling, why would you build a $25,000 operatory and then stop and, and not put a drill in there or an amalgamator? I mean, what? So, right. so talk about, so do you think Southwest Airline, do you think Herb Kelleher would want every dental operatory to be a Boeing 737 identical? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and that's what we always suggest that the operatory should be exactly the same in design and in the, uh, in the small equipment. So, Every you can't tell the difference between operatory two and operatory five, and there is no hygiene op, there's no oral surgery op, there's no oral laser op or crown and bridge op. Every op's the same, so any op can be 
uh, used for any procedure at any time by anybody. And that is going to eliminate the scenario you just uh, mentioned, which is, oh, uh, we have to move you. Because every time you move somebody, it costs a minimum of $32 to turn the operatory over. Yeah, I mean, that is uh, that is just so... Uh, okay, so um, I, there's so many things to talk about. I mean, there's dental office design, there's design flaws, there's ergonomics, uh, there's location and property dynamics, there's office decorating, there's dental demographics, there's, sh- when, dude, when, should I relocate my practice? There's lease terms and negotiations, there's landlord-tenant occupancy, there's so many things. So yeah. I'm just trying to boil down in my head most questions asked via email per day at Howard at dentaltown.com. Uh, the, the biggest ones, should I rent or should I own? Uh, that, yep. that's, that's a big one. How, after three decades of looking at this, do you think it's better to rent or own? Uh, hands down, own, hands down. And I think the optimal ownership um, modality is a condo. In other words, you, 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 you do not have to uh, maintain uh, all four exterior walls. You know, you, you've got to maintain essentially two walls. And I think that that is the optimal ownership methodology today. But absolutely ownership, ownership, ownership. Uh, when, the, when a doctor sells their practice, they're going to enjoy about a 30% premium if they own the practice excuse, and own the building as opposed to, or own the condo as opposed to leasing the building. Huh. That is, uh, that is amazing. Um, some people are afraid. I mean, the reason they run a thousand square foot and try to put four ops in there and the reason they avoid your entire career is they, they always hear some guys calling it the Taj Mahal. Oh, you don't want to build the Taj Mahal. It's right. always the Taj Mahal. Um, I've been to the Taj Mahal. I've lectured near the Taj Mahal. I, I don't make the connection, but it's it's money's the answer. What's the question? Do you yeah. cringe sometime when you see somebody building the proverbial Taj Mahal and you think, ah, they, you, you should have done that? Um, I think that, first of all, you want an office that is consistent and congruent with the level of care you propose to your patients. A period, paragraph, end of story. Having said that, uh, you also want to have a facility that matches the locale that you're in. So you want to make a statement of quality about your care, but at the same time, if you're in uh, what well, you use the term, uh, you use the uh, geography of Kansas. If you're in Kansas, in rural Kansas, okay, we, we don't want to have uh, something that's gilded. We want to have something that's quietly elegant. We have, want to have something that conveys the level of care that's being uh, offered to the patients in that locale. But you don't want to be outstripping the uh, the uh, uh, locale's uh, decor. Because then it'll look like it'll be too expensive? Um That could be part of it, but I'll tell you, uh, and this was just an an unbelievable uh, experience that I had uh, a few years ago. We built a dental office, which was truly the Taj Mahal, in uh, what I would call um, a a town in which the last picture show was shot. Uh, It was just a a, a desperately poor town, And uh, and the doctor... Uh, did not just well, he did fantastically well. So well, in fact, that well, he had a partner that now they, they had to um, that they had to actually create another facility in another adjacent town. And the second doctor moved to the other facility because they had outgrown the first facility. I'm going to say that um, there's always money. And, uh, and I think it's so many times there's always money in different uh, uh, socioeconomic environments and doctors consistently underestimate the ability of the uh, patient base uh, to want a higher level of care. And, and I'm also going to say that uh, the, the vast majority of, um, of the patients that we encounter 
uh, are looking for a better level of care. Uh, so I, I, I would I would never be apologetic for creating an environment that allows allows the doctor to practice at the level they were trained to practice at. You know, on Dental Town, they're always posting their floor plan and, mm-hmm. and saying, "What do you think about it?" Uh, right. well, you've seen more floor plans than anybody. What What is the most obvious design flaws when someone says, "Hey, Mark, will you look at my my floor plan?" What right. are, What are the things that you're just like, "Oh my God, I can't believe I'm still seeing this." Um, they're They're trying to stuff ten pounds of caca in a five pound bag. Say, man, they're, they're, they're putting way too much in the space that's available. And they can't, you know, if you think of, um, if you think of the, uh, the operatories as fighter jets and they have a very specific mission to accomplish, you have to have the support structure to uh, keep those fighter jets in the air. And you've got to have a support structure for the operatories. And so much of the time, uh, doctors are trying to create uh, too many ops in too little space. And, uh, and that just creates more and more stress for, for the entire team. So I would say that's the biggest uh, mistake. The other one is they, uh, so many doctors think that the, the, um, the elegance and the beauty of the, of the office is going to be coming from the exterior footprint of the building. And, and so they want to have these odd looking perimeters, you know, uh, ma- making it almost look like, you know, a medieval castle in terms of the uh, uh, projections and recessions of the footprint and uh, or semi lunar footprints or a uh, an L shaped footprint to the building. And, you know, it, the, the, the elegance and the beauty of the building actually come from the roof line. It comes from the roofing materials and it comes from the material that you put on the on the walls of the building and on the window, the window frames and then the lighting that you use also. So, no, I, I'm, I'm going to say that uh, the, the, yeah, those are probably the two biggest mistakes I see. One is size and the other one is the shape of the footprint. What, what about light? I always hear companies talking about, oh, this light has the full spectrum of the sun, so you're taking a shade. Uh, you would need these types of uh, light bulbs. Some cosmetic dentists say, no, you have to have windows in your room. I, I, you hear it all. Uh, where, where, where do you come down on windows and lighting? Okay. Uh, the, the purpose of windows, and especially in the operatories, is to distract the patient. Period, paragraph, end of story. Uh, there's no other. There, there's no other uh, reason for a window. Uh, the the way we're going to take an accurate shade is to have an ambient lighting system in the in the operatory and in the office that can mimic uh, natural light. And there are some very specific parameters to that that I cover in the uh, in the conference and in my book. But uh, to go into that now is almost getting into weeds. But uh, and there's a very specific configuration of lighting uh, system also inside the inside the operatory uh, over the over the head of the chair and at the foot of the chair and at the side valences on the uh, over the side cabinets. And it creates a very specific intensity of light at a very specific wavelength. And that's going to allow the doctor to take very accurate shades. So that, and in this, I, I, Howard, I would say this one other thing about lighting. There's no bigger bang for the buck in a dental office in terms of the design of the facility than creating a, gl- a great lighting plan. A great lighting plan can be done for about $8 a square foot in the new office, and that includes the design as well as the installation of the lights, and it, and it creates a magnificent um, uh, environment. And if, if you just go back to that uh, uh, comment about Starbucks, If you walk into a Starbucks, you'll see 110 to 150 lights on the ceiling of a 1,500 to 2,000 square foot Starbucks. I mean, it looks like a runway up there. And so that is a uh, that's a fantastic uh, uh, example of how you use lights to create beautiful environments. 
You know, you, you keep saying the word environment, and I'll never forget um, listening to uh, the founder of Hilton. Uh, what was his name? Randolph Hilton or something like that. Yeah, and, and he, I'll never forget a story he told, and it was um, that he'd always ask his customers what was the big complaint. Well, when they started building high rises, the complaint was always waiting on an elevator, waiting yeah. on an elevator. So the next one would have, instead of an elevator, she had had two. And yeah. then he thought the next one's going to have three. And then, and then he had four. And he said, this one has twice as much elevator as they need. And we never, and we solved it. And it was still the complaint. And so then an industrial psychologist said, well, yeah, because when they push that button, they're just staring at it. And then you put the numbers above the door. So they're watching where it is. He goes, take those numbers away. So they don't know where it is. Put a window there so they can Mm -hmm. look outside or a mirror. So you look at themselves and now they will miss the elevator when it comes to their floor. And he and the the smartest people in the world always know how people work. And do you think um um so right now someone's probably listening to this right now. Uh, they got out of school, they they've done their 3 to 5 years working for someone else. They want to build their dental office. They're going to try to do it on the cheap. They're going to try to put 10 pounds of corn in a 5 pound bag and do the whole thing in one operatory and we're saying slow down spanky. You're going to practice for three, four decades, have a break room, have a damn window. But do you think the person in the better environment will have less burnout, disease, and dysfunction at the end than someone who likes their um, their environment? Did, did you see the YouTube video called The Rat Cage? Oh, absolutely. In fact, I, I've got, I can say this from experience that I will run into so many doctors for whom we've designed an office at uh, different Dell meetings. And they'll say, Mark, you have absolutely rejuvenated me. I love going to work every day. I enjoy being in the office now. Uh, the office is a pleasant, uh, non-stressful environment for me. It is, it, it's changed my life. And that's a comment they frequently will make. It's changed my life. And I thought, well, this is, this is fantastic because they like dentistry again. And it renews their, uh, their enthusiasm for the profession. And my daughter said something recently that uh, she's a, 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 a emergency room physician in a, uh, in a hospital. And she said, you know, she said, I call all kinds of specialists. Uh, to come in for one reason or another. And she said, invariably, I don't care what the specialty is. Sometimes they can't fix it. Sometimes all the king's horses and all the king's men can't care for this patient. It's over. But she said, I have never, ever, never called an oral surgeon. And the oral surgeon comes in and says, we can't fix it. She said, dad, she said, dentistry is the only a profession of medicine that can fix everything in its field. And I, I, I just thought about that for a second. I thought, this is unbelievable. She's right. She's right. You know, there is nothing we can't address now. And that, I mean, so we want, you know, so my admonition to the profession is, for heaven's sakes, let's look the part. Let's look the part. I mean, if we can fix everything, let's have an office that actually looks the part, whether it's small, medium, or large. So your daughter is an emergency room physician? Yeah. Wow. Um, um, Wasn't it uh, Hippocrates that said the best physicians uh, were trained in war? I mean, the emergency room, that's the war zone of the hospital, is it not? Yeah, it is. It is. Does she like it? Um, yes, but now she is almost the oldest person there. <laughs> and they're not. So you, you, if you if you get it, Howard, they're not very old before they all end up leaving. Uh, because uh, when she when she first joined, the chief of the uh, service was thirty eight, and uh, and now uh, she's at that point, and so. Um, yeah, I think she's probably coming to the end of her, her um, what I would call the rough and tumble part of the uh, of the of that world. Yeah, that is a well. Okay, so we talked about dental office design as far as construction. You said you would work with the uh, the people. We talked about design flaws. 
Um, ergonomics. Mm-hmm. What, what, what comes to your mind when you think of building a dental office and ergonomics? What, what's the low hanging fruit on ergonomic lessons you've picked up? Okay, uh, two big things. Um, and I'm going to start out by just telling you a very, very short story. And that is when we began actually developing the principles of design, um, we said, you know, what's the objective? And I said, well, I'd want to earn more money if I was, uh, if if I were investing uh, a million to 2 million to 3 million, I want to return on the investment. I said, but the other thing I want to do is uh, reduce my physical stress in this environment. It, dentistry is just physically difficult. So one of the things that we started doing, the architects and the interior designers and myself, we would count the number of times a, uh, an assistant walked from, the, uh, from an operatory into sterilization every day. And we found that the average uh, assistant walks into sterilization almost 100 times a day. So uh, that's a clinical assistant. So we have to create a, uh, a, a sterilization area that's very close to the ops. So we began developing principles that put different rooms in relation to other rooms and the highest frequency rooms became closer and closer together. So we, we started grouping uh, different rooms of the office uh, based upon frequency of use. And, and uh, so that's one of the really low hanging fruits, the development of architectural zones. So we developed a clinical zone, a public zone, and a staff zone. The other big low hanging fruit was uh, being able to minimize the repetitive movement inside the operatory. And uh, with that, uh, it, it just means that uh, uh, we wanted to employ a very specific type of, uh, of delivery system, and we wanted to have it in a very specific uh, dimension. And so the, uh, the dimension that uh, we really keyed on was the, uh, the, the reach of an average dental assistant, the average female in North America. We found out that was 27 inches from the axilla down to the, uh, down to the knuckles, 27 inches. And so we put the dental chair in the middle of the, of the operatory and the side cabinet, each side cabinet was 27 inches from the uh, side of the dental chair. So now we could be seated and we could be treated, treating the, the, uh, the patients in a seated position. And we are not using any kind of extended motion. Wow, that is uh, very good. Do you, um, and all I want to say to the young kids, if I could go back, you know, if I could go back and do one thing differently, my God, I trashed my entire neck with that direct vision. And yeah. when you and I were little, um, when, when we when you and I graduated from dental school, at least more than half of the oral surgeons were all doing it standing up, uh, yeah. and at least twenty percent of the general dentist. And right. they told us when we sat down, it would trash our back and neck. Who was right? Do you think stand up dentists were were smarter? I, I mean, I don't think looking at all the baby boomers sitting down, leaning over. Right. Uh, I, I don't. I, I don't. No, if I can say that was a good idea, what, what, do you, what do you think? Okay, it's not about the standing up or the sitting down. It's about three things. Keeping your head over your shoulders, being able to keep your arms and your elbows down at your side, and keeping your back straight. Those three elements. And if you have the right dental stool, and you have the right dental chair, and you've got the right delivery system, you can be seated and you can keep your back straight, you can keep the elbows down at the side, and you can keep your head over your shoulders, and here's the key, without using any muscle, okay? We're not gonna hold our back up straight using muscle, we're gonna use physics. If we have the right dental, the doctor's operating stool, if we've got the right stool at the right height, and we have a positive pelvic tilt to that stool, we're going to be able to sit there using physics to hold the back up straight, keep the elbows down. And we keep the elbows down at the side by positioning the patient. 
you know, up or down. And so obviously dental chairs go up and they go down. The back can recline as well as go up. And what we want to do is make sure that that patient's head basically is at our, the level of our belly button because there you're able to drop your elbows to your side. And now you're just using a, uh, a rotation of the shoulder like this rather than reaching, which is a class four movement. And so there are five classes of movement. We want to engage in one which is a class three movement. And that's why I highly encourage uh, the doctors to use a, uh, a dental assistant and employ four-handed passes because then you're able to engage in only this one movement, which is the, the class three movement. And I would really recommend that whole idea of, of uh, yes, indirect vision. It, tremendous. I mean, you if, if you've got to use direct vision to see everything, uh, you're going to be in a world of hurt uh, 10 years into practice. You know, I really, um, you know, you have those two books. You should make those uh, online CE courses on Dentaltown where they could take the online course, they could get the book, you know, they have it all there. But uh because these are just lessons that, um, I mean, you don't get a practice opening up a bunch of dental offices. You're probably only going to do it one time, and then you're stuck with your dental office, your spouse, your kids, and all you would do to go back and change all of that. Um, so uh, that that is um, very, very interesting. So the next thing that I see, um, when I'm at picking up a dentist, I visit a lot of dentists who have uh, drinking problems and need to go out for uh, restaurants afterwards and have beers and watch sports. And um, you'll you'll see them. Um, they're jerking that overhead light. They're always they're pulling. Yep. You know, and it's it's like on this train track rail or it's a pole. Um, I, I see a lot of people fighting their whole career with their light. Uh, right. And and the and some of these things are so dumb. Like 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 you look at the um, the overhead light. You want to adjust the overhead light where where you grab the handle, right where your thumb lands, is where you turn the light off. Mm-hmm. So every time you grab the light overhead, you turn the light off. And then on like even on mine, my 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 high speeds and slow speeds, they're they're quick connect. So right. then when I grab my high speed, I grab it and lift up. Well, guess what? Half the time, it's now in my hand. And I'm like, well, you can have a quick disconnect in the same direction you pick up the, you know. So so, so weigh in on that. Weigh in on first go lights. Because some people are going with headgear. And now they're, they've gone from a dentist to a minor. Uh, there's pole lights. There's overhead lights. What, what's your thoughts on lights? The, uh, the, the very best light to use is a track-mounted light. And I recommend actually that you use two track mounted lights. Much of what, you know, it, we've all seen operating rooms and the operating rooms have a minimum of two operating lights and the light is coming from two different directions. And then they never have to move the light. And, and that's what I would recommend that, that a doctor has a, um, a track mounted light and they have two lights. Uh, on that track mount. And now we've got light coming from two different directions. You never have to move the light during the procedure. Even if you're rotating the patient's head from right to left, it, it doesn't matter. It's still, it's the, the light is still there for you. So that's, that's one thing I would recommend. Um, and the, um, the, the other thing I'm going to just suggest is you absolutely want to have a ambient light that is of appropriate strength in most of the most of the illumination in our operatories is way too low and so uh, uh, ophthalmologists tell us and the way we design offices is we want a 10 to 1 ratio between the ambient light and the operating light so if your operating lights working at 5000 lumens you want your ambient light working at 500 lumens and that way, when you lift your eyes out of the operating field, the uh, the, the jump in the uh, light intensity is not so great that the eye becomes fatigued throughout the day. How I always I always keep the light as low as possible just to enhance my appearance. Uh, <laughs> you're saying, uh, okay, so um, so you're gonna build a dental office, and a lot of times, um, I mean, dentists are. <laughs> 
I love them, but they're like, I like, well, why do you want to put it there? Oh, that's where the Sleepy Hollow Creek comes down. And I love that area. And it's so beautiful. And I'm like, the Sleepy Hollow Creek, huh? I don't know. What what matters to you more, the Sleepy Hollow Creek or demographics? No, the, the, um, the absolutely, it, it's going to boil down to, um, a combination of I want to be in an environment that is consistent and congruent with the level of care I propose. So I want to be in a neighborhood that's like that, or I want to be in a business locale that matches the quality of care that I propose to my patients. The other thing is uh, I, I do not want to spend a uh, uh, a fortune on the site preparation. So it's really important that I um, that, that I'm in a in an environment in a uh, locale or a geography that you know it's not on the side of a mountain. I mean, as a, as a an extreme, okay? Uh, because now we're going to have to have a tremendous amount of site preparation. So it's a it's combination of uh, uh, of looking at the economics of the situation as well as the um, matching the the uh, the locale with the quality of the care and then of course there there's the issue of well how pretty or how nice is it but you know what what we had we had a doctor who um who uh, was in uh, uh Colorado and he wanted to be able to look out at the Rocky Mountains and I said if you're looking out at the Rocky Mountains you're not earning any money so that's really not an issue for you. Maybe you'd like the patients to see it, but th- they don't need to be inside your office looking out at the mountain. They need to be in the dental chair and you need to be training them. So the only purpose of windows, as far as I'm concerned, is to distract the patient when they walk into the operatory. The patient walks into the op, they're distracted. They look out the window, they sit down, they go past all the scary stuff. And, and now they're seated. And the reason we don't want to, um, I guess, uh, visually frighten them is frightened patients don't buy things. Okay? Frightened patients don't re- readily accept the care. The, the trust between the doctor and the patient is eroded with the fear. So let's, let, let's take that, that, that uh, uh, obstacle off the table. Let's distract the patients. Okay, that that is uh, neat. Um, but when you said windows are for distracting, mm-hmm. do you think it's better that the patient is sitting there looking out the window so they don't see the dentist coming in the room up behind them, or do you think it should be flipped around so that the patient is seeing the dentist come in? I mean, I, I I've seen dental offices where it's the same office, but the patient's facing exactly different ways. Wh- which way do you think they should face? Um, I, I, I think the the issue more Howard is centers around the, uh, the the number of steps the doctor has to take in order to get to the head of the chair uh, coming into the operatory, and the optimal way to get into the operatory with the minimal number of steps is is a two door or dual rear uh, rear entry, and so. I mean, and again, this all goes back to our concept uh, of design principles where we're trying to minimize repetitive movement. And, and this is a big issue. Repetitive movement is cumulative and it's damaging. Okay? Repetitive movement's a lot of uh, repetitive movement is a lot like radiation. And so we really want to avoid that uh, repetitive movement and and so that dual rear entry allows that to happen uh, at the same time the patient is uh, it is facing either the window and looking out the window to a scene the uh, the sleepy hollow creek or they're looking at a piece of art that's illuminated on the wall or um, they're, they're looking at a sculpture they're looking at something that's interesting, and and or you have a or you've got a a, 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 a flat screen on the wall, and it's displaying a lot of beautiful uh, environmental scenes. Well, I can't believe we uh, went over an hour. Um, what does it cost if someone wants to uh, talk to you? Or uh, so your website is mynewdentaloffice.com. Right. 
Okay, what, what, so my homie's listening to you, and he wants to talk to you. How, how much is a, a consultation or to talk to you? Or uh, I, I charge $300 an hour for a uh, – if somebody just wants to talk, you know. But uh, if, if they want to come to the conference, which I would really recommend – uh, because in that two day conference, they, they learn about the principles of design and they learn that design is not an artistic endeavor. It's highly scientific. Uh, we've broken this down into a, um, into a very, very methodical and orderly, uh, approach in science. And so, uh, it's very, very formulaic Howard. And so if people come to the conference and then they want to have a conversation with me, that's free <laughs> because I, I, I'm available for individual consultations immediately at the end of the conference. And so the conferences are held at, um, at the ADEC facility in Newburgh, uh, about 12 times a year. So there are lots of opportunities, probably, you know, about once a month. So how do, where do they get that? It's, it's an ADEC or, or Pelton Crane in Ohio? No, 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 no. I, I, I no longer, uh, I no longer do any, um, uh, events at Pelton and Crane. Oh, so and it's all ADEC in Oregon. I'll do it at ADEC or, you know, for example, I might do one for, um, like the Hawaii Dental Association or, um, uh, the Des Moines, uh, Dental Association, you know, something like that. So, uh, but, but uh, uh, I'll post that wherever I'm going to be, I'll post that on my, uh, on my website. But it's but you're at a deck every once a month. Once a month. Oh man! Um, so you should do the um, the seminar, and it's a two day seminar. Two day event. Right. Two day event, and you time it right with the salmon run. Time it, yeah. Do you? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. We, 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 yeah, yes. It's, it's always associated with, uh, yeah. Either the salmon or the bird hunting. Yeah. I mean, I, I love Oregon, man. I, I love, uh, I, I, I think that whole, what, what is it? New work, Oregon, new, Newburg, Newburg, yeah. Oregon, yeah, Newburg, Oregon. It's about 45 minutes, uh, outside of Portland. Yeah. And, uh, and just a, a beautiful, beautiful, it's in the premier, uh, Pinot Noir, uh, Valley of the United States. So I mean, fantastic vineyards in, uh, in this particular, uh, area of the country. So you just catch a big old 40 pound salmon, get a bottle of wine and call it a day. Last but not least, uh, one, just one more question. Um, I don't like the term United States of America, cause I don't know how you compare Kansas to San Francisco or, Florida to New Hampshire. I mean, the Federal Reserve even says this is nine different economies flying under one flag. And I know that nobody in Europe uses the term EU. No one compares Germany to Portugal or that. But but so regards to green dentistry, I'm hearing dentists say that I advertise I was off the grid and the whole dental office ran solar and I have patients driving an hour to come to my dental office off the grid. Now, I'm sure that's more popular in Oregon and Silicon Valley than uh, and then Texas, where you are. I, I don't know, but do you see green dentistry coming in? And when you see, um, be, because these kids are making long-term bets, do you think they should bet on solar off the grid? Um, I know dentists who built a 5,000 square foot dental office and they can't even tell me how much electricity it uses. Uh, right. And then I talk to um, people who convert buildings to solar and in Phoenix, where you have more sun than anywhere that I know of in the United States, most of the solar installers say, well, the problem with solar is let's say that uh, Mark calls me and I go to his house and it costs a dollar to put it on solar. Well, if Mark was going to spend a dollar, I would have him spend it below the roof. He doesn't have his lights automatically turning off when someone leaves. Or, so he did every single thing wrong under the roof. And he wants me to get all that from his roof. So right. just talk about uh, finish up with solar and green. Do you think that's going somewhere? I think that more of an ideological bent that the doctor might have rather than a financial decision. And, um, and if we're talking about, so we're going to separate those. If we're talking about purely a financial decision, 
I think that uh, it will be very, very questionable if you'll ever recoup the investment that you made in the in the um, uh, energy saving component of your office, uh, even if you're there for 17 and a half years. I really think you're better off from a financial standpoint with a very conventional uh, office that pays attention to exactly what you said, you know, about a, a, a smart environment. Uh, that is connected to the Internet of Things and allows you to uh, have lights turn off in a room when you leave the room, that the, uh, that the, the uh, heater uh, drops uh, at, at night, the air conditioner goes up in the evening when the last person leaves, but it doesn't go up so much that you have to turn it on for hours the next morning. You know, so everything's balanced out. So I, I think that... Uh, if you're going to if you're going to go green, as they say, um, it, it's an ideological decision. It's not a financial decision. That, but but it but it might be a marketing decision in some areas. Do you think not? Uh, well, I, well, well, like like I noticed, like in Phoenix, I can pay higher electricity bill mm -hmm. if I only use electricity from the solar farm. Right. But I, I don't do that because I'm not dumb. But I I know dentists who do it. And then they advertise, I'm off the grid. You know, I'm totally all that. And they claim that that's a, a, a marketing, um, that that works for marketing. But are you not really seeing that? Yeah, I you know, I would imagine it will work in a place like Portland, Oregon. Uh, because people are much more attuned to that. Uh, but I would have to say that uh, I would much rather put my money, my marketing money, into the environment of my facility so that it matches the quality of the care. And, and, and I, that is, if I had to leave one message with, the, with your audience, that would be it. Um, if, if you'll do that one thing, you have emulated Starbucks' a secret to success. And, and it truly is a secret to success. And people think it sounds so ridiculously uh, simplistic, but Einstein said simplicity uh, executed well is very difficult. And, uh, and, and indeed, it, 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 it can be. But I think that is the, that's, that's the key to success. And um, more than any other element, more than the green issue, you know, anything like that. Well, it was an honor to get the 400-pound gorilla to come on the show today and talk about all things design. And, uh, my gosh, you're only going to do it once. He even says when you do it, you're going to stay in there 17 and a half years. I mean, hell, that's a long prison sentence, right? Yep. I mean, I wouldn't even want to go to jail for 17 and a half years. So if you're going to go to jail for 17 and a half years, yeah, might as well be nice. And uh, if, you're, if you can't, if you're just itching to get out of your house so you can go home and sit in your favorite chair and turn on the big screen and open the refrigerator, have it in your dental office. Uh, my boys, I had four boys. What I like the most about when I built my dental office is I put a little play area out front for my four boys. I put a bird box uh, back there. I, I basically never took my eye off my four boys when I designed that dental because I wanted them to have fun when they visited daddy, because when I was little, when I visited my daddy, hell, he owned a Sonic drive-in. I can't compete with onion rings and tater tots and french fries, but I tried hard. I wanted it to be as close to a tater tot as I could. But uh, Mark, thank you so much for sharing all your wisdom and coming on the show today. And uh, if you ever want to um, combine those, uh, those uh, manuals and books you've written on Amazon, uh, to online CE courses. I mean, uh, I, I really like what you've done on Amazon, a guide to designing the elegant dental office. Just go to Amazon and type in Mark Tolan, T-H-O-L-E-N-D-D-S-M-B-A. Mark, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Howard, thanks so much. I really, really enjoyed it.